video is how to get started carving your speedball speedy carve block and how to use these linoleum tools and basic carving techniques. Um, the main thing is having some place where it's really comfortable to sit. So I lower my chair and I try to be fairly low to the table instead of having to, you know, bend and lean over on top of it. So the, you know, sort of chest height works uh, a lot better. So that's tip number one. I totally get that not everyone has a chair that's adjustable. When I'm carving at a table where I can't adjust my height uh, to get it in a good position for carving, I get out my trusty carving books. <laughs> These books I've had for years and I only use them to carve on. Uh, this way I can put my block up here. I can rest my elbows on the table. This helps uh, support my back, which is nice. And I'm very close to my block and I can carve. And I'm again, I'm avoiding hunching over uh, to see what I'm doing. So good ergonomics. So figure out something as you're trying to uh, set up your place where you're going to carve. In this video, I'm going to focus on talking about the sampler project, which is the first carved project for you guys in Printmaking One this semester. You're going to carve a block that's going to look something like this. I actually made two of them. So here's my first block that I did, and here's my second block. You do have a required number of grids that I want to see. Basically, they're going to look something like this. I want you to really play around with learning to carve, practicing, making all sorts of marks and patterns, and also understanding the difference between black line and white line. So understanding how you make white lines and then how you make something stand out as black line, as a black shape against a white background. So this is the project that's the one at hand, and that's probably the one that you're going to be seeing this video first on. Just to give you an idea of where we're going though, after you print your sampler, we're going to start making a key block. This is a block that we're going to print with the sampler, print on top of it actually, right? We're going to print this first and then we're going to print this on top. Um, to show you how you can take a one block print and turn it into a two block print. So you see on here in the background, this is this block right here. Different colors, but the same block. And then of course this is the same block and printed on top. So this is where we're headed, but we're starting with this sampler project. The way I start any print project is with a drawing or a sketch. Often I've done some smaller sketches first, maybe in this case for the sampler doodles or some, you know, stuff like that, which would be great to use for the sampler. But then I have to get to a point where I get the drawing full scale. So I want it the size of my block, right, so that I can transfer it onto the block easiest. It's uh, really easy to just trace around the block like this multiple times, right, instead of measuring and drawing it on the piece of paper. That way you could make multiple sketches for whatever your idea is and they would be full scale. And so you'd be able to see how they work in full scale and see whether, um, you know, which one you want to choose and go forward with. Obviously this is a sketch for the sampler project and these are two of my sketches that I did for the samples for the key block project, which comes next. The great thing about having them on tracing paper, of course, is that we can then transfer the image onto the block, and I'll show you that in a second. But the other thing that we could do is we could take our image and decide which orientation do we want this final print to be in. I drew it in this orientation, but I could transfer it on the block and have it be in that orientation for the final print. The reason why it's a good idea to check this, it's also a good way to check the balance of your drawing. Because it might look balanced this way, but not work that well as a print in this orientation. Anyway, it just gives you a chance to look at that and, you know, reaffirm that, yes, okay, I want the finished product to look like this. What I do is I always write print. That means I tell, I've told myself 
I looked at this and decided this is the orientation I want my final print. And then what I always do on the other side is I write block. So this has to be the orientation of the block because when you print the block, it's going to flip left to right and be opposite. So I want to make sure that when I transfer this onto the block, this is why I write that on there, I have block correct reading. That means when it prints, it'll go back to the print orientation. So that's why I always print that on there. And you may see in some of my videos, um, you'll notice that. Or in some of my handouts, you'll see that written onto some of my images. Okay, so if I, if I change my mind about which orientation, I'm going to need to transfer the graphite onto the other side because it's the graphite we're going to use to transfer. So I would just put this down and then draw on this other side, right? So that the graphite would be on this side to transfer. Okay. I'm using a very soft pencil. It's almost like a 3B pencil, like softer than a regular pencil. But you definitely want a real pencil, like a regular 2B will transfer much easier than a mechanical pencil, which uh, those are a little harder. Okay, so, oh, one other thing. When I'm doing the tracing of these, this rectangle is going to be a little bit larger than this. So keep that in mind when you finalize your drawing here, that if you have anything on here which is way too close to the edge, or might be you know arbitrarily too close and not be a good composition, be sure that when you're transferring it, you're double checking, you know, where you're actually putting it. You might want to ease it over this way a little bit or something uh, to correct the composition. So just uh, something to think about. On the speedy carved material, I wouldn't recommend drawing directly on the block. And you can draw directly. The problem is you can't erase very easily off the surface. So it's a much better idea to plan out a drawing ahead of time. Okay, so with this one, I know this is my print, and I want my block then should be in this orientation. To transfer it, again, graphite down, I am going to line it up where I want it. And then holding it with one hand, I'm just going to rub it with the back of my nail, or you could use the linoleum tool. But I find that, um, you know, my hand works just fine not pushing very hard. Notice I'm holding onto it with my other hand so it doesn't move. I don't get sort of a double image. If you peek and look, you can see great, right? Really easy to see the drawing on there. Transferred really well. You could double check that you haven't missed a spot by accident. Okay. So now we can see that the print orientation would be this and my block is opposite to that. If you were doing text, you do the same sort of thing. Here, let me just take a, the back of another block to show you. If I want to have uh, words, right? You just make it correct reading here. And then when you flip it, it's automatically backwards. Don't trust your brain to uh, flip it the other way around. I mean, I can draw and write backwards too, but your brain is just gonna take that opportunity to uh, mess with you. So it's also a very good idea before you start carving that you hold this up and you look at it in the mirror and just double check that it is correct and that it's backwards on the block, BB, the way I think about it, backwards on the block. Okay, so I'm ready to carve. A couple extra things about the project requirements I want to go over. You have to have at least six one inch or larger um, grids in your sampler. So figure out what you want to do. In your project information, I'll have some basic format suggestions, you know, that could be like this or it could be like these shift a little bit, right? But it could be totally lined up. Also, as you start carving, if you want to break down the grid, like I do on this one, it's much harder to see the grid, whereas this is still pretty easy to see, that's completely fine with me. I just want you to start with a gridded format like that. What I'm looking for in this project 
is that you have really a big variety of marks and that you show that uh, you're going to get better at carving. You know, you just will, and this is supposed to be a practice block. I really don't want you to start over. You know, if you carve away something that you shouldn't have, figure out a way to make it work. Change how you are going to carve that pattern. You can do it. You'll be okay. Also, with this, I found that this is the first sampler block I did. And if you do one with this kind of level of patterning, that would totally be fine with me. This one, I really pushed it. I wanted to see how much detail I could get out of these speedy carve blocks. One thing that will make your sampler a better image for the next part of the project when we print it with the key block is that if you have your print look more like this one in the sense that it has a very closed sort of border. What I did over here with this one is there's actually, you know, I carved away part of the block right here and there's a void, fairly good size void right here. This ended up looking a little bit awkward in my prints. Um, I was able to just spin this around and print it the other way and it worked fine, but avoid big uh, voids along the edges. This, this was fine, this was fine, but it was just here where I had carved away a little um, section there. That was not a good choice. So when you're trying to decide what you're gonna carve, be, sh you know, be sure you leave that as, uh, I mean, it's not solid, that's not the right way to put it, but not any large voids, okay, that, that connect into the margin and it'll be a better print for when we print it with the key. Another very important requirement for your sampler is you must do curved marks and curved shapes, not just, um, not just checkerboards, not just stripes. I want to see curved things, circle things. Why? Because those are harder to carve really well. So you definitely have to include both of those. Beyond that, this doesn't have to be a complete singular sort of pattern in each grid. Like here I did circles, right? And on this half of this gridded, I did white circles and then I switched and on the other half I did black circles. But you don't have to, and this, this grid has a very similar sort of pattern, so does this one. But you don't have to do that. You can do uh, a grid section as more of a picture. So, you know, I, I'm giving you a lot of leeway. I just want this to be your practice block. So push yourself. Let's see the kind of detail you can get. These are the Speedball linoleum carving tools. They work great on speedy cut blocks, on linoleum, but they're not meant for woodcut. They're not tempered steel. You might have purchased a set, in which case you'd get the handle and a variety of blades, or you may have bought the handle separately. You don't need to, but you may have bought the handle separately and then bought blade, blades in these little two packs. Either way, if you get a set, you might have uh, additional blades than the ones I'm, uh, I have here. One is a knife kind of blade and one is the number four and it's sort of like a flat U-gouge. So these tools, these blades come in different sizes. So uh, let me get rid of some of these extra ones. The smallest one is a number one, and the number for what the number is for the blade is found right on the back here. This is a number one. This is a number three. I need my glasses. <laughs> and the number two, here's a five. There's another three. This looks like a two. Yeah. So one, two, three, and five. Like I said, four has this sort of this kind of profile and then there's a weird um, kind of blade that looks like that that's supposed to be I believe a knife I would just use an exacto knife if you wanted to carve with a knife okay but the blades you're going to be using the most is probably the number one because that's your smallest one that's how you're going to make your smallest marks you will also probably use the number five for clearing especially getting rid of a lot of material in the background because it's a big U gouge. And then number two and number three are sort of somewhere in between. So the number two has a little more of an acute angle, uh, but it's still sort of like a soft V gouge is what I would sort of call it. And then the number three is a little bit bare. 
So the newer tools have a screw off uh, bottom part, which is great. And this is where you can store your blades. So that's very convenient. And then of course the blades go in here. So if you take these apart, you'll see that there should be two pieces inside. And so these form that chuck that will tighten up and hold your blade in the right place. So just be careful you're not losing one of these and that after you've carved for a while and you take your blades out and store them in the base here, that you're sure to cinch this back down again, just so it doesn't decide to uh, come off on its own. <laughs> and then you lose that little piece because that means you need to get a new handle. Okay, so those two pieces, if you've ever used an electric drill or anything, you're very familiar with this kind of thing. This blade is going to go between that and then hold it together when we put it back in here. So what you do is make sure that these pieces are put together like that. Put them in there. And then slide the base of the blade between the center mark and that smaller, thinner U piece in there and then cinch it down. Sometimes these tools have blades that, uh, or the, the base part here, is not formed correctly right, and sometimes it's really hard to get these to seat themselves all the way down into the chuck. If that's the case, you can. Sometimes I've taken pliers and squished these together a little bit, and that can help, but sometimes it also breaks them. <laughs> um, but just know that even if you can't get it all the way in, if you can only get it, you know, there or something, as long as you have it in there really tightly and it's really secure, you won't have a problem carving with it. Another thing that happens with these tools very often is that the blade gets stuck in there and that you loosen it. This one's easy, but if you loosen it and you just can't get it out of there, take this whole thing off and bang this on the table. These will drop out and then you can get that out. I've found that's the, by far the easiest way to get that blade out of there. You could take some pliers to it, you know, loosen it up and then grab the end of this with some pliers. But I found that, um, <laughs> much to my detriment, I have found that that can be a little dangerous, that it can slip and, um, and it doesn't really work. Like banging it on the table works the best. Okay. These tools are meant to be pushed through the materials. They're not meant to be used, you know, scratching like this or uh, yeah, anything else, you're basically either pushing it through or you could you know, turn and work with it that way. So that's how these tools work. As I mentioned, these blades are not carbon steel. They're not tempered steel, I should say, so that they will not stay sharp forever. And because they're not made out of good quality steel, you really can't sharpen them. They're meant to be replaced. So. Just keep that in mind if all of a sudden you realize that you're having trouble carving or the blades are slipping or something, it probably means you need a new blade. Some basic things here. If this is a side view of our block, we want to make sure that when we're cutting, right, we're cutting sort of like this when we cut away the material, right? So that if this is the top of the block where I'm inking and I put pressure down, there's material here to hold uh, that edge. I don't want to be doing what's called undercutting, like cutting like this into a block, because then I have these sort of areas which are not supported at all underneath, and those will chip away and crumble away on your block. So the way I like to um, explain it is that, and let me make this even more dramatic, make my point like you know you've gone like this into the block is that you want these areas these upper areas to be kind of like mesas right or tops of volcanoes you don't want them to be diving boards okay um, if you're using the tools correctly and you're not burying the tool down in the material you basically are making these sorts of cuts but if you want to try to do some intricate cuts with X-Acto knife or something, be sure, be sure that you're angling it away from these edges so you get a bevel to it. I have one of my tools with the number one blade in it, and I have another one with the number three blade in it. 
You don't have to have two handles, but it is convenient if you do have more than one that you don't have to switch out the blades all the time. One thing I asked to get you in your material list is a roll of this um, shelf liner stuff, this non-stick material from the Dollar Store, Dollar Tree. If you didn't get it, it's, it's just fine, but we're going to use it in a variety of ways this semester. One of the ways is we can use it to put under your block to help to keep it from sliding. These speedy carve blocks don't slide very much, uh, but it can really help having this there. And then you're, if you're right-handed, your left hand isn't expending all this energy holding on to this guy. So up until now, you've been worried about your drawing and maybe you've uh, colored it in to get a sense of what's black and what's white and all of that, and that's great. But maybe you haven't really thought about what areas of my block are going to be black and what areas of my block are going to be white. You should be thinking about that. But um, I often get questions like, oh, okay, here's my drawing, but now where do I start carving? And what I always say is that usually there's some part of your drawing that you've already made up your mind about. Like, I've already decided this is gonna be a donut, this is gonna be black, that's gonna be white. Okay, maybe there isn't any other spot on your drawing where you've made that decision yet. Then you just start with that section where you've decided. Because once you start carving something, everything around it is gonna be informed by that. So you have to think of all the edges, every place that uh, hits everything else is an opportunity to change it, change it to be white line, black line, all that kinds of stuff. So once you start, then you're gonna have something to um, play off of, so to speak. This material doesn't tend to want to pop off of the block when you carve it. So sometimes you have to kind of wipe it like that. I'm gonna get rid of the blades in there so this doesn't shake. Okay, so this is a push tool. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is to do a circle, I would put the tool into the material and notice how my right hand isn't even moving. I'm just holding the blade really steady and then I'm rotating the block with my left hand. And that is the best way to get a really cleanly carved block there. Same with anything that's curved. I would set it and then twirl the block like that. You pretty much have to start with outlines, but they may not remain outlines. Once you go in and start carving the background away, you'd be breaking down one side of that line and it would just become the background. So don't feel like you need to over outline things. Think about them as shapes instead of lines as much as you can. These tools are meant to be used like this. They're meant to be gouges like this. They're really not meant to scrape the material or anything like this. You can do that. The issue with that, with this material, is it tends to just sort of bead up and it doesn't work all that well. Uh, with linoleum, the same kind of thing. Yeah, it makes cool scratchy marks, but they're very shallow and they're very hard to print consistently. So um, yeah, that's not how these tools really are meant to be used. They're meant to be used like this, uh, meant to remove material like this. These sampler blocks, you have such small detail and I really want you to push the amount of detail you're getting. So you might use the number one blade for the whole thing. It might not be until the uh, key, bl uh, key block project that you switch and use your uh, larger U gouges. Now this one, now that I'm starting carving, I don't really like right here. You can erase, just try not to abrade the surface because this is actually a pretty delicate surface on this block. And I can add things, draw things. Also, um, I'm sure that I'm using a dull pencil because, again, I don't want to abrade the surface, but you totally can add things if you change your mind on what you want to do. One thing that can be fun with these is that you can rock the tool and make a very different sort of mark on here. So 
hard to see because it's pink on pink, but I'll darken it in a second and you can see. Just a little bit of a wiggle. Now with any of these sort of things, what I'm looking for or what I want you to develop in the course of the semester is control in your carving. So um, if you are gonna do wiggle sort of marks, be sure that it comes across as being purposeful, that it's that they're all not just wiggly just because you don't have control. And that's that's not good. The material often doesn't come out of these blocks because it's sort of a plastic and it holds onto it. So you might need to do what I'm doing here, just sort of lightly get the tool in there and then um, pull out the little pieces there. Cross hatching and hatched lines will give uh, an illusion of tone. Uh, but really what we're talking about here is yes-no kind of carving. Uh, it's just that some is smaller yes-no than, than other pieces. So switch your mind to think more shape instead of line. And so that's the challenge here is how do you take your line drawing and translate it into a relief carving? One thing I'm doing with this block is that I'm carving the whole block. I'm not just starting over here and then carving to the other side. And I'm jumping around. One reason I'm doing that is that I, as I'm carving, you know, this, I'm thinking, hmm, I like this kind of striped. Maybe I'll do a same sort of treatment in how I carve this, thinking balance across the block. Also, by thinking ahead, like once I've decided this, it's just carving it. So I could be, my brain could be moving and thinking about something else at the same time. You can, of course, do little marks and do little hatching marks, and this will give you an implied round line around forms rather than just having a white line around everything or carving so you have a black line around everything. There's lots of ways that you can show that movement or that change, I should say, between one surface or one area of your block and the next one. When you're carving out the edge and you're trying to go off the edge, this material, see how when I do this, it's like it's bulging out right here. The way to get a clean carve on the edge is actually to come in from the outside of the block. And this is pretty much true for any relief material. That if you don't get do that, first of all, with this material, it sort of bounces back at you and you literally can't carve all the way off the edge there. Um, but anyway, this is the easy way to get a nice, clean, carved mark along the edge. So I always say this material is bouncy, kind of. This material is, is pretty great. I don't have any issue or think of it at all as a K through 12 material or, or something like that. I am not a material snob in that sense that beautiful prints can be made using any sort of carving material. It's all just in the authority of how you printed, the control and the decisions that were made. Even though I may have colored in my drawing, I still make changes as I'm carving. That to me is the fun part, just responding to what I've already done and deciding that I want things to look a little bit different. Notice too that I twirl my block so that my right hand and my right arm stay in the same position all the time. I usually have to do this to get those out of there. And I, again, I just find that uh, expedient uh, works really well, is efficient in terms of my time and my energy. So I'm always carving basically in the same position on the block. When you first start carving, you won't have a whole lot of control. Uh, you know, you might carve a little too far, or it might slip or something like that. The way to avoid that is to only try to carve about a quarter of an inch, half an inch at one time. So instead of trying to do this whole line, you might just do 
that far. Then you can just put the tool back into that groove and continue on again and all of that. And you'll have more control. Um, that really will be, re sorry, really will show as more control if you're trying to do curves. Uh, but with a little practice, you'll get it. One thing I am not doing is that even areas where I think I want them solid white, like I might make that solid white, this might end up being solid white behind these objects. But I'm not carving them solid white right now. I'm not committing to that. I'm carving much more shallowly so that I keep the material there and I can fine tune it later. Sometimes I leave the material with a lot of it in there and then I wait until I actually print it for the first time and then I see um, whether it works and whether I really wanna take it all the way down to white. Sometimes when things are solid, solid white, it's really distracting and they like hover in front of the print and they don't um, you know, work compositionally with everything else going on. It's really important with carving is if this is my little U gouge much uh, blown up here, I don't wanna sink this material or, I'm sorry, sink the blade into the tool really deeply, it will, and it's very easy to go deeply with this, it'll just, you know, grind on in there and you'll have to like back out the tool and you won't have anything that looks like you have control. It's more like you want it like this. Maybe no more or a little further than halfway. And really light carvings, I might be only this far into the tool. So, that's really important that you're paying attention as you're carving to these top edges and that you're still seeing them in there. Okay, this is the number three. So I can use this larger tool and of course I'll get larger marks. They don't wanna pop out because I'm carving and then making a hard stop here, but I can tease them out of here. <laughs> Okay, so if I carve like that and then stop, I get marks that look like that instead of a sort of tapered, you know, mark that looks more like that. You can also, if I couldn't get that material out, I could come in the other way, right? Carve the other way and get it to come back out again. I think the thing that works the best is just doing this kind of thing. You might notice it's uh, kind of hard to see what you're doing on the block, right? So, you know. With wood, I would darken it, but with lino and these speedy carved blocks, I usually don't darken them. Um, if I have a good light on there and there's a raking light, I can see my carved marks pretty easily. However, a really easy thing to do is take some of your graphite, put it on the tracing paper, and then I can lightly rub it over the areas that I've carved just to see what's going on. And to see, like you can see all my little carved marks there. And I'm not putting so much graphite on that I can't also still see my drawing. And so I like this method because it lets me do just parts of it to see what I'm doing um, and not have to cover up other parts of um, my drawing or, or in other words, not to have areas where the block overall is so dark that I have trouble seeing my drawing. So you just keep going and going until you finish your sampler. Be sure that you wash your block really well and get this excess graphite off of there before you go to print because it could mix with your ink. You may have noticed that I'm holding the block in a certain way, that this is my carving hand for sure. This hand, I use my index finger as a stop. So I'm pushing with this hand, but I have this here as a stop. I don't always do, 
but often I have it there. I'm not applying pressure, but if I feel it's going to slip or I'm whatever, I can use it as my break. The other thing I do is that I use my thumb and my other fingers to hold the block. So I'm holding the block like this, and then I'm uh, stabilizing this hand with my pinky. <laughs> so I'm doing this, and then this is here. So I've made this, I'm making this stable sort of unit for myself on how I position myself when I carve. Eventually, you're going to get to a part in your carving where you're not sure what to do next, and really you need to print to see what's going to happen. There's usually areas like this where I've done cross hatching as a way to get a tone, or small little marks, or maybe marks like this, or I'm not sure if this is completely white. I can see that the graphite is hitting on some little peaks there, so it's probably going to print a little bit, but I'm not sure how much it's going to print. And so there's always these fine-tuning things that you need to do uh, to adjust the value and to maybe clear some things more, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So you're going to get to a point where you need to do that. You need to print. But maybe you haven't evaporated your Akua liquid pigment yet. You're just not ready to print. You don't want to take the time to set up and do that. So there's a couple things you can do. You could do a rubbing, which I'm sure you know how to do that. You could just take the edge of your dull pencil, put it on your block, I haven't carved very much yet, so there's not much to show you, but you could take a rubbing of it and then you could kind of see what it's beginning to look like. But you know what? In this day and age, I find the easiest thing to do is take a picture of this with your camera, turn it into a black and white image, make it a silver tone in your iPhone, and then reverse it. And that's just so easy and so fast and you can get an approximation of what it's going to look like as a print. Most of what I spent my time carving was cleaning up the chatter in between everything. Notice that I've purposely left these marks to give everything a little bit of a wiggle, you know, um, and so that it's not just this purely black-white kind of carving, but that there is some texture and everything has a little bit of motion by leaving some of that. So I don't want you to think that chatter is necessarily bad. It's just how do you control it and how do you make it look intentional. This is what it tends to look like around a form when you haven't cleared enough away, right? When I carved this edge of this flower, I ended up with that material left there. But I've cleaned it up every place else except right there. So just keep an eye on that when you proof that if all your forms have these thin little lines around the edges, it means that you need to do more tidying up. Have fun carving your sampler blocks. Remember, this is going to take longer than you think. So take breaks and uh, just enjoy it. Also remember, this isn't the artwork. This is. Printmaking is indirect. We make a matrix, and then we ink it, and we transfer the image onto another surface. So good luck, and I really look forward to seeing your prints. Hi, I'm back. You didn't really think that was the end of the video, did you? I just want to share with you a tip. I've found that these, when they're wet or after they have some ink on them, they can get kind of sticky. And then if you store them stacked on top of each other, they can kind of stick. And that made me really nervous, so compulsive me, I cut some matte board, but it could just be heavy paper too, so that when I store these, I make a nice speedy carve sandwich. And that way the top of the boards are protected and they don't stick together. So I would highly recommend something like that. Okay, now I'm really leaving. Bye.